before private. Now notice how it doesn't say public worship to be preferred, never mind private. We're, we're not saying that. It is very carefully worded, the title of that sermon, public worship to be preferred before private. This is the title of a sermon that was delivered by a man named David Clarkson. Does anybody know who David Clarkson is? No idea. Does anybody know who John Owen is? No, yeah. oh, John Owen. David Clarkson was a fellow minister of John Owen. He was his apprentice, if you will. He was under the tutelage of John Owen. So he, he comes from good stock. He's, um, he's a pretty solid theologian, pastor, preacher. And in that era, he was under the tutelage of John Owen, learned much from him. And if there's one thing that we as a church really appreciated or appreciate John Owen for, it's his understanding of the church, right? Congregationalism, proper church order, biblical worship. John Owen was really good with that stuff. And David Clarkson definitely was as well. And he was preaching a sermon, very Puritan-esque of him, on one verse, okay? Psalm 87, verse 2. The Lord, and this would have been probably the translation they were using, the Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwellings of Jacob. Now, I don't want to preempt this afternoon or this evening sermon too much because I'm actually preaching on a similar psalm, not exactly the same, but it touches on a very similar thing. I'm preaching on Psalm 132, which speaks of how Zion is the chosen dwelling place of God, where His presence is rests. Okay, so very similar, but it's a different psalm and it comes in a different context. The Lord loveth the gates of Zion more than all the dwelling place of Jacob. And from this, he developed and drew out a robust theology of the centrality of public worship. Okay, how would you define public worship? Anyone? Ian? Okay, so in congregational, so that would involve probably more than one person, yeah. right? It's not just you alone. So public worship by necessity would be congregational. There would be some kind of two or three gathered at least, right? What else? Um, anyone can show up. Anyone can show up. Yeah, well, that, that is certainly true. We certainly always have our doors open. That's why it's public worship, not secret worship. Now, given there are times and seasons in the history of the church where our public worship had to be done in secret by necessity, or else if we didn't do it that way, there would be no public worship, right? But yes, that is a part of it. It is a call to the public to come, behold, worship our God. Anyone else want to add to that? Okay, so interestingly, although that is an integral part of the Christian life, that, which is still a very good answer, um, falls under really the, the individual life of the Christian or the private life of the Christian. So I'm glad you brought that up because by saying public versus private, we're not saying um, letting people know versus being a secret Christian, obviously not. Even the private Christian life is something that is out in the open. But since we've got in here, to distinguish between the two, public worship is that act of God's people corporately gathering as a public witness both to themselves and to the world. It is that special time of meeting. It is a special time where the church not only meets with one another, but most importantly, it's a special time that the church meets with God. That is not to say that God does not meet with you in private. That is not to say that God does not meet with you in your personal devotions, or when you are alone in your bathroom praying to God and worshiping Him, or in your family worship, or in the midweek Bible studies. But in the Bible, there still is definitely a difference. So remember yesterday, for those of you who were here, we studied um, the Sabbath and how even in the life of Israel, it was always six days of work and one day of rest. And if you study that theme of that one day of rest and the concept of rest 
throughout the religious life of Israel, it always implied worship. So some people get confused with the Sabbath. It's just a day of rest. And we say, yes, it is. And it implies we rest from our earthly affairs so that we might focus completely upon the very thing that we were created to do. Communion with God. Worship of our triune God. Meeting with Him. Speaking to Him and Him speaking to us. Private worship. What are some examples of private worship? Devotional time. Yeah, some personal devotional time. Five minutes a day. 30 minutes a day. Would we say family worship? In one sense, yes. You know, it's kind of, it's kind of having an aspect of corporateness because it's more than one person. It's a togetherness. But it's still in one sense private, in the sense that it is not a public meeting of God's people, it is not an assembly of the firstborn as Hebrews 12 speaks of it. Anyone else? Individually, like singing. <coughs> yeah, so when you're alone singing, when you're just praising God by yourself. Yes? Online church. <laughs> ah, <laughs> online church. You know what? We, we ought to very charitably, we ought to very charitably say, yeah, you know what? That's private worship. Yeah, we, we ought to say, okay, yeah, that is private worship. It is not a gathering. It is not an assembly of God's people. So bundled up with this concept of public worship is the concept of assembling together. All right? People of God, assemble. That's what we do in public worship. So the Hebrew word in the Old Testament that spoke of the assembly of Israel is the kahal, the assembly, kahal. And then that is often translated in the New Testament using the word then ekklesia, the assembly, the gathering, the congregation, or as we often translate it, the church. So the church isn't really a church if it does not church. Do you, do you get that? Yeah. The assembly of the people of God is not an assembly of the people of God if it does not assemble. And in the life of Israel, you see the centrality of things like the temple, the sacrificial system, the priesthood, all, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Levitical of people from the tribe of Levi were trained as worship leaders and musicians and singers for temple worship. It was the big thing. You'll see it in Psalm 132 later. Um, and then in the New Covenant, it's not that the assembling and the corporate worship is no longer central. That doesn't change. What has changed is now we do not worship in human temples. We worship in all places wherever you are in the world, in spirit and in truth. Neither on this mountain, nor on that mountain, but God calls all people everywhere to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And that's why we have local churches. Now, whether you be in Melbourne, whether you be in Sydney, whether you be in another country, you congregate with the people of God for public worship. Now, I want to finally get to this. Clarkson very helpfully draws out 12 reasons as to why public worship is to be preferred before, sorry, why public worship is to be preferred before private. I'm going to just go through them one at a time very quickly, and then we're actually going to go into discussion groups because I want you to talk to each other about this and ask questions about this. I'll guide you through that, don't worry. So number one, the Lord is more glorified by public worship than private. God is glorified by us when we acknowledge that He is glorious. And He is most glorified when this acknowledgement is most public. It is, if you will, a public display of affection. Alright? It is PDA. If you have deep affections for God. It is not something kept secret. It is made public. And what better place for that affection for God to be made public than the public meeting of the church. Two, there is more of the Lord's presence in public worship. You've got to think about this one. More of the Lord's presence in public worship than in private. He is present with His people in the use of public worship in a special way. More effectually, constantly, and intimately.
The book of Hebrews, quoting from the Old Testament, says that Jesus, not using the word, of course, but referring to Jesus, is in the midst of, assembly, of the assembly, praising the name of God. Jesus Christ is in a special way spiritually present in the assembly and before anyone comes up and leads you in worship, Jesus Christ leads you in worship. He is present in the gathering of God's people and that's why we can actually take seriously in Matthew 18 when he does say, when two or three are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. Now, you know a plethora of ways that applying that might go weird, but definitely you've got to understand this. There is a promise attached to the congregating of God's people. And that is that He is in a special way in their midst. Why do we keep saying in a special way? Well, first of all, because God is omnipresent. We're not saying He's not present at your house. He is present everywhere. There is not a single place in the world where He is not omnipresent. He is not present in all places and all times. He's always present in all places and in all times. But there is a special manifestation of the presence of God when the people of God meet. Thirdly, God manifests Himself, I just said this I think, more clearly in public worship than in private. For example, in Revelation, go read it, Christ is manifested where? In the midst of the assembled, of the assembled ones, in the midst of of the churches. Four, there is more spiritual advantage in the use of public worship. Whatever spiritual benefit is to be found in private duties, that and much more may be expected from public worship when rightly used. Do you benefit from Bible reading? Do you benefit from being in prayer constantly? Trying to pray without ceasing? Yes. And what we're saying is that when the church is gathered, there is even greater use to things like Bible reading and prayer. I'll just give you some practical examples, right? When you are reading the Bible at home and studying it, you can get a lot out of it. Amen? You really can. But let us not forget that the Bible says that God equips and calls preachers and teachers who are especially gifted to teach the Word of God. And if a person can sit at home and use a study Bible where the person who read those notes you don't even have a personal relationship with and you through those notes can greatly benefit from it and go like, oh, thanks for that insight. How much more when you are under the oversight and shepherding of gifted and called preachers and teachers? Prayer. Praying alone is great. Don't stop. Keep doing it. But how great is it to pray together with the saints like this morning? How great is it to share what's going on in your life, bear one another's burdens, and pray for with one, one another? And how great is it when the entire congregation is united and led in the words of a prayer where we together with exclamation can say, Amen. We are in agreement. We are in, unite, we're in unity as to what we are praying. Public worship is more edifying than private. In private, you provide for your own good. But in public, you do good both to yourselves and to others. Right? That's why when we sing to the Lord, that's great. You can sing anytime you want. But when we sing to one another, that's what Colossians and Ephesians says is a very, is a very enriching experience when we encourage each other through things like congregational singing, it is more edifying because not only are you getting more out of it, you are giving as well. You are edifying, encouraging, and building up your brothers and sisters. The gathering of God's people is the only place where you can legitimately do the one another's of the New Testament and where you can actually use your spiritual gifts, which God has given you not for your own good, but for the good of your brothers and sisters. Six, public worship is a better security against apostasy than private. Mm. He who lacks or rejects public worship, whatever private means he enjoys, is in danger of apostasy. In danger of slipping back and maybe even falling away. Why? Because when you are your own pastor, 
you're always doing great. When you are your own pastor, you know, you're, you're, you're having a great time. You're a wonderful Christian. You're way better than everybody else. All you've got to compare yourself to is, well, yourself. But when you actually have discipleship, accountability, both correction and encouragement, oversight and shepherding, we're not saying it's impossible for somebody in the church to apostatize, but we are saying that the gathering of God's people in the local church is a much better security than being a standalone Christian. Charles Spurgeon, I kept thinking about it because of the fire, used this wonderful illustration about church membership and he said, you look at the fire and you look at the coals in the fire and they're burning hot red embers. But if you were to take one of those pieces of coal and remove it from the fire, it'll still burn, but give it some time and it will cool down and die out. The same is true for the Christian. The Lord works His greatest works in public worship. Conversion, regeneration, etc. are usually accomplished through public means. Just look at that amazing day of revival, the day of Pentecost. It happened firstly on the Lord's day. It happened secondly, not in a private meeting, but in a very public meeting. It happened for all to see and witness. And what was there on that Lord's day as the Spirit so greatly broke out in power, in salvation. There was preaching. Sinners were saved, brought to repentance to the Lord Jesus Christ. There were baptisms. There was more teaching. There was breaking of bread. There was prayer. There was a sharing in all things. Eighth. Does this work? Hmm? Hmm? No? Oh, there you go. Public worship is the nearest resemblance of heaven. Okay? It's great if you have three people at home at a Bible study. That's awesome. But as you join the gathered church that's comprised not only of one group of friends or one family unit, but a mix, a community, a messy community that is nonetheless saved by Christ. And as this community congregates from different backgrounds and are in different walks of life, you get a clear picture of that heavenly vision where, every, where God's elect from every tribe, tongue, and nation will be assembled saying, Worthy is our Lord. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. This is a much clearer picture. In the Bible's depictions of heaven, there's nothing done in private, nothing in secret. All the worship of that glorious company is public. Ninth, the most renowned servants of God have preferred public worship before private. The Lord did not withdraw from public ordinances, though they were corrupt. Public worship was more precious to the apostles than their safety, liberty, and lives. In the midst of great Roman persecution, the Christians did not cease to meet. Sometimes the authorities would walk in on them, arrest them, arrest their pastors, put them to death, execute them. Throughout church history, that has still happened. But these things, safety, liberty, their own lives, the fear of losing these things was not enough to hinder godly people from congregating. Tenth, public worship is the best means for procuring the greatest mercies and preventing and removing the greatest judgments. You see, even in the Old Testament, when God's impending judgment was to fall upon the people and the leaders of Israel saw that there was famine in the land and there was a need for repentance, there was a need to correct the people, to awaken the people and wake them up from their spiritual stupor, what would they do? They would call the people. They would call them to worship. They would gather all of them and one of the scribes or teachers would open up the book of the law and would read from the book of the law and God would use that to bring about great things, to bring about repentance from the people. Eleven, the precious blood of Christ is most interested in public worship. Private worship was required of and performed by Adam in his posterity, even in a sinless state. Adam had to worship God regularly. That's what we were made for. But the public preaching of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments have a necessary dependence on the death of Christ. Baptism signifies 
our death, burial, and resurrection in and with Christ. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper symbolizes and sets forth the body and blood of Christ given for us that we might be fed and spiritually nourished from Him like many of us will enjoy this afternoon. These sacraments have a corporate nature. You don't go around just baptizing yourself. You don't see that anywhere in the Bible. And just because dad is a godly Christian doesn't mean he gets to baptize you in the bathtub. And you just can be your own family church and that's it. The model in the scriptures are clear. These are public witnesses. It doesn't mean you have to live stream them or post them on social media. That's not what we mean by public. But it does mean that it is an act of the church. It's an act of the gathered people of God. And 12, the promises of God are given more to public worship than to private. There are more promises to public than to private worship, and even the promises that seem to be made to private duties are applicable and more powerful for public worship. And we need not, not go any further than Jesus' simple words, when two or three are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. Prayer meetings in the book of Acts. Remember when Peter was in prison and they didn't know what to do? What did they have? They had a prayer meeting. And they were so shocked at how God worked through that prayer meeting. Because next thing they know, here comes Peter. He's not in prison anymore. And they're like, what? And, you know, the response to that is kind of like, well, duh. You guys got together and prayed and God did an amazing thing. The day of Pentecost, what precipitated that? A prayer meeting in the upper room. The first church ever planted in Europe, what precipitated that? There was a place where the Jewish women regularly gathered for a women's prayer gathering. And through that, God used that community to plant the first church there. So here are 12 reasons, and I hope you find them compelling. And if you don't, that's fine. We can talk about it. Why public worship is to be preferred before private. We have a good amount of time, at least 15 minutes now, to break up into, I want to keep it smaller this time, groups of three if that's possible. When you go into five or six, I mean, you just know nobody, and not, not everybody's going to get to say a word, you know, at that point. I saw you guys scrambling during prayer time earlier. The women especially. I was closing in prayer like we haven't even prayed a thing. Um, you know, at least some of them. Some of them. It happens. We get into it. That's good. That's not a shame. That, that's, that is not a shameful thing. So groups of three get together. For the people in Locke, I sent it to all attendees. I sent this. If you're not in there, somebody in your group will have it. I just want you one at a time to recite each of these reasons. And I just want you to look at each other and ask like, why? Is this true? Do I really think this is biblical? I mean, if this is true, what am I doing about it? If this is true, what am I doing about it? If you don't think this is true, and the other people in your group think it is true, ask them, well, why do you think it's true, Luke? Why don't you show me from the Bible why you think this is true? Right? We'll have about 15 minutes or so to do that. Go get into those groups of three.